Welcome everybody to a webinar around the low block and emergency defending. Uh, Jimmy Gilligan and myself, Stuart Delaney, will be hosting the presentation. I would encourage you to consider and reflect upon the information which we discuss around what it means to you in your environment. The overview for the workshop is uh, discussing what a low block and emergency defending is. What does it look like in your environment? So again, just consider around our discussions and some of the um, experiences and knowledge we maybe share around how it relates to you. Um, how we um, make sense of a low block emergency defending around the England DNA and what tactical and technical requirements are needed to try and be um, really kind of excel at this kind of uh, defending. So we've got a short video to show you um, around the principles of play. Again, just watch the footage and just make some notes about what it means to you. So hopefully um, provoked a, a lot of thought and um, <coughs> reflection around what a low block emergency defender is. Some absolutely great um, little bits of footage and some great graphics around how the principles of play uh, come to light throughout. Um, this is what a low block emergency defender is de um, defined by um, ourselves as, a, as an FA. So out of possession, defensive third. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. The final phase of defence and then emergency defending and goal protection. So... What we want to try and do and what we encourage you to try and think about is how it relates to you in your context. But what the conversation myself and Jimmy are going to have today around um, his experiences around when he worked for Noskin Forest and how he worked with the under-23 um, players around the low block emerge defending. 
and also how we've kind of related this to working on the A license as well and how we're working with um, candidates on the course and also players who, who come in. So these are kind of things we'll be looking at. And then obviously we're going to try and think about how it relates to the physical corner and what considerations we need to place upon this. So again, just focus on the right hand side of the model. So the out possession principles, the press delay, cover and balance, compactness, control and restraint uh, will allow us to maybe start to delve in a little bit deeper around um, you know, what the game is and how we can start providing certain kind of solutions to problems, what the opposition might cause. So through the England DNA, we tried to um, summarise a lot of the key um, points into kind of one pages. So this is now a possession slide making play predictable. But as you can see from the diagram, uh, we want compactness, certainly in kind of um, the middle to back third of the pitch. Um, it can be deployed as a, as a tactic to um, nullify a team's strength um, as a low block. It might be a tactic where they may be broke through the high press and through the mid block. And now they're getting onto our last third of the pitch. So compactness is key and we want to show them away from our goal. So around, not through. And we've got to think about how the opposition might play and how we can utilise our strengths to try and win the ball before we get to a point where we've got to remain to defend. So that's a predictable play. This is a bit more towards the, um, the final third. Um, so, you know, getting them wide and keeping them wide. Get into a position where we can stop the crosses and how that might have an impact on the rest of the team's shape. And then if they do get into the uh, into the box, how do we mark, cover and defend the goal and think about our 1v1 kind of duels and battles? So this brings us on to the kind of conversations really around um, shared experience. So um, what I'd like to think about is utilising this kind of coach planning reflective model. And what, he, what we're going to try and think about is how we kind of bring this to life with Jimmy Gilligan at uh, Nottingham Forest. So just as you start to think about the model, as you see it now, we've got a continuum at the bottom. This may be um, um, a period of time. So what is it we want the players to learn? And through a period of time, how can we measure this learning? So this could be a week, could be a month, could be a season or seasons. And it's really important to identify that through this period of time, we don't have to, in one single interaction with the players, go after too many outcomes. We can be really specific around what we try and get the players to think about to make sure we can um, reinforce the learning, consolidate the learning, and move on to um, to layer the detail and complexity of the nature we, we're trying to work. So if we're really clear about the intended outcomes we want to try and achieve, and we'll go on to Jimmy's um, in, intended outcomes around the session shortly, if we're really clear about what it is we want to try and achieve, we can then try and design practice or learning activity which speaks really closely to them intended outcomes, which gives the players really clarity and a clear idea around um, what it is we're trying to look at. In line with this, our coach behaviours will be shaped off what we want to try and intend to achieve, but also off the practice we've designed. There are a lot of frustrations from coaches, and I've been there myself as, um, as, a, as a younger coach learning. If we get the design of practice wrong, often that leads to our frustration. And we end up trying to manage the practice rather than actually coaching the detail to the players. So if we can get the design of practice really kind of refined and really kind of um, aligned with, with the game and what intended outcomes we want to try and achieve, we as coaches can really start to think about the detail the individuals need with that within the unit and the team. This will in turn um, hopefully engage the players more because we're having more uh, personal contact with them, giving them some really specific information to try and achieve the intended outcomes. But also, if the game's um, the right game, then the players will be engaged because they, they're really kind of motivated because it's competitive and real and it all interconnects. So that's kind of the model around how we plan practice. And then in turn, after the practice, you can revisit the model and use it to reflect upon. So, you know, did you go after too many intended outcomes? Were they the right outcomes you wanted to try and achieve? And did the practice design and learn activity, along with the coach behaviour and player engagement, allow the intended outcomes to to come to light so that's kind of a um an overview of what the model is what we'll try and do we'll try and bring it to life a little bit around jimmy's experiences with his his players in his kind of previous environment so question to you really jimmy is how did you utilize your multidisciplinary team in the planning stage of the practice um thank you Stuart. so so what we we did uh, so that 
uh, the learners understand um, we are match day plus one. So we played the day before and I were using, I was using players who had um, not had many match minutes and I needed to make sure that we would got them up to a, um, a state of um, physical fitness that the uh, strength and conditioning coach wanted. So on the session I brought to St George's Park, I had a number of players who didn't play the day before. I had some youth team players as well. And I actually had a couple of senior pros in there as well. So the mix of the team was was really interesting. Around the MDT team, obviously, my strength and conditioning coach was really important because of the data um, that we had back from the game the day before was very high. So we wanted to make sure that we could get something out of the session that would bring the lads who didn't play the, a lot of match minutes back up to where the rest of the group were. The senior pros, uh, we, we need to just basically keep ticking over and make sure that they're in good shape were they to go off and be available to be at a club. And then obviously we had some young youth team players in there that probably hadn't been at the physical capabilities that we're at with the 23. So we had to manage them carefully. Um, the physio obviously had an input into that in terms of players. We actually had uh, one player who'd come back from a long-term injury that, that had been back on his rehabilitation work and he was I think this was his second or third session on pitch as such so we we had to be aware of him and also because of the youth team players I mentioned we we actually had to get them out of um, education for the morning so I was um, having to deal with the uh, education well welfare officer um, as well as 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 the other MDT team as well and also make sure that the the kit men and we have an intern knew who was going to be there for SGP vests and uh, sorry um, the, the vests so that um, the GPS vests and everything so that we got everything together at the right time so that took place that started taking place straight after the game and then we took that into obviously traveling to SGP uh, and then setting up the session prior to to going out onto the pitch so, so lo lots of things to maybe consider in the planning stage Jimmy around giving the players the best experience to try and meet the needs of of the individual, but also obviously the team, because you obviously got the 23s ready for, for the next games. So how did they come together to decide what the intended outcomes were? So I know we've illustrated on the right-hand side of the model around what you were trying to be, um, achieve from the practice, but how did you come together to decide this? And, you know, I know you mentioned around match day plus one, but what, what considerations did you have to have around, um, you know, other players around, you know, physical top-ups, for example? So you might have players who've, who prepared for the game, not been in, involved with the game, but then you've got to start thinking about um, how to give them what they need so they're in the best physical shape, ready to succeed in the next game. Yeah, so as I said, you know, there's a real mix in the group that I had uh, at SGP on that particular day. Um, and certainly we got players who would be in and around the 23 squad all the time, so their physical top-ups were really important because we... We are a um, actually a high pressing team, and so we go after teams. So we will want the boys to be in the best physical uh, shape they can be. But added to the fact that you've got senior pros, so you know I think senior pros should be treated with with the utmost respect as well. And the lads that we had in the group, the, the two in particular, uh, were fantastic lads. But equally, they knew that they always had to keep themselves in shape. But was we going to push them as hard as we pushed the younger lads? Probably not. But equally, we, that they're also at the point where if they need a bit more, they'll tell us and we'll go from that. And again, we had to be careful of the physical loading with the um, with the young the young players as well in terms of the fact that they're not up to the capabilities of what the 23s, as I said. So on the session that we did at SGP, we were looking to get around about five, five and a half K for, for that morning. Um, but bearing in mind, we knew that we were going to get an awful lot of Axel D cell working. Uh, um, in, in that particular session just because of the, the nature of where the, the session was taking place in terms of the pitch geography. So uh, with the physio it was, and the S&C coach, when, when we talk about the uh, warm-up, it was really important that my S&C coach actually done a warm-up that would incorporate lots of lots of work around Axel D cell. And um, I think when we did do the session on the day, he, he really nailed that for me. And, it, and, and one or two of the people that, that were watching the session actually comment on it. And I think that was really good. No, the, the, movements, the movements we had in it was sort of backwards, forward movements, short and sharp, sidewards, 
out quickly with your feet left and right, turning your shoulders left side, turning your shoulders right side. You know, so we had lots of different types of movements going on in the warm up in order to basically get them. I think in a way you're 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 priming the brain to to get yourself going. Um, and I think that that the warm up really helped to the players to get themselves going. No, and I think I think it's great how you've kind of moved us on to the next question, really, around you know the considerations around practice design and the learning activities. So you mentioned already about your S and C coach starting to think about designing practices which allow the players to perform certain movements to get them ready for the next bit. What was your kind of considerations in the practice design around your internet outcomes? How did you, and I know we'll come on to it in later slides around the practices you did deliver, but what was your kind of thought process around uh, the types of practices you wanted? And how can you? How did you start to think about layering the, the practice to kind of start to um, start to lay the complexity, of the decision making available to the players? Well, as as I explained earlier, we are a team that like to go for the the front, really. So we are a, a high pressing team, but we don't have a. We didn't seem to have a what if strategy. So we we started to look at uh, myself and Chris Cohen, who I work with. We started to look at. You know what if what when when we come up against a cap one club in the, the Premier League Cup, who you know we know we have to be honest that might be more superior to us on the ball, might might spend more time in possession than us. We 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 wanted to look at a, a way of defending, so we decided to work on a, a low block because we felt we'd got players who were brave and were strong um, and were prepared to put their body on the line. So we looked at low block and emergency defending, um, and obviously. Just the, the the nature of the the, the topic would tell you uh, where geographically that might take place on the pitch. So, like you've already said, with the England DNA in the defending third of the pitch, uh, we we sort of took it more. If I just show you very quickly towards the eighteen yard box area, um, and and kept it in that area there. So that was that was one of our sort of considerations. And also, we wanted to look at um, the five lanes of the pitch and how we keep the the back four compacting that with the goalkeeper and what's in front of the back four and how we can use certain things. So we, we came up with a menu and we looked at the uh, the slide and screen. We looked at um, sensing danger. We looked at the blocking hole. We looked at defending ugly and we are heavily asking our players to look at the triggers from the opposition. So when we talk about triggers, we talk about the opposition player on the ball. Where's his hand placed? Where's his foot placed? Is he pulling his leg back a long way? Is it going to be a short pass? Is his, Are my defenders' eyes on the opposition players? So for me, it's really important that, that we get our players looking at cues and triggers from the opposition. Um, and then we wanted to take into consideration what the role of the holding two midfield players would be in this as well. No, Brian, I think the obviously we'll come on to the slides around, you know, the type of practice you designed, but it allows obviously the intended outcomes to come out really well. Um, and that kind of leads me on to the next one around the the kind of the coach behaviour. So you alluded to the fact that, you know, Nottingham Forest was a high pressing team. How did that shape your coach behaviours in trying to um, encourage them and demonstrate to them that this was the... Um, the way of playing and a different way of kind of defending what was kind of different to them? Well, before, before we went to St. George's, we, we had a chat with this group of players. They, you know, they knew they were coming over after the game had finished the day before. Um, and we talked about the low block and, and, and basically what does that entail to them? Um, and what did they think about it? And, and they, they, the defenders in the group and, and the defending midfield players in the group were really relishing it because it was a, a real challenge for them to come, to a different environment, be in front of people and actually put on a little bit of a show. So, you know, we're asking we're asking defenders to do what they want to do most. And I, I believe that, you know, young lads should know how to defend 1v1, defend 2v2, 2v1, 1v2, uh, defend as a unit, defend as a group. Um, so, you know, we'd had a chat prior to that and set up, set up um, sort of the, the, the scene really. But equally... We wanted, we wanted the players to take ownership of it in terms of um, being brave out there and deciding when when it was right to go and engage with the, the opposition. But also about around about the communication, we felt that was going to be really important. So who's going to take the lead? We, we felt the group that we 
we'd taken to St George's Park actually didn't have really many leaders in there. So it was a really good opportunity for one or two of them to shine on that day. Plus, you've got young players in there, and it's a good look. It's a good chance for you to have a look at, at the younger element of the players. Um, so when I, when I actually got into the session, there was times when I would drive the session and my voice would go up a little bit quicker because I would I'd want things done quicker and 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 more aggressively. And there'd be times when I'd come back off it and let the players just deal with it themselves. Um, and, and also, my voice would sometimes go up quicker because I wanted them to be um, more, more aggressive in attacking the ball or sharper getting to the ball uh, and, that, and that type of thing. So from, from my point of view, there were a number of different coach behaviours that I adopted. Um, I also had a goalkeeping coach there that was behind the goal as well at times, watching from, from behind the goal with the goalkeeper. So he was advising the goalkeeper. Um, and I also had... Um, the intern that I talked about, he would make sure that there was a, a number of balls so that we could keep the session going. So with the coaching behaviours and, and the way I wanted to do it, I could keep the session going for as short or as long as I wanted to. So my rest and work ratio was really important. I think on that particular day, looking back, we didn't work over any, any anywhere over two and a half to three minutes at a time. And then in between those times, I would I would probably own that little bit of the session. And in, in during the session, the players would own it a little bit more than me. No, I think that's great. And I think obviously when we go into the session, you you, you talked about utilising the goalkeeper coach and the S and C coach. Obviously, the session you kind of split, didn't you? So you had two coaches working either side. So do you want to talk maybe a bit around how you kind of utilise the rest of the staff around trying to give the players what we need? So um, the, the design of practice links in really well with the coaches to try and work as a pack of coaches. But then we're talking around. Um, making sure the players get what they want. So it connects the player engagement as well. So, you know, how did you utilise Chris? So Chris, when Chris took a group of players that we weren't, so you're right, yeah, we split the group down, Stu. And although the board looks as an 11 v 11, I'll take away the players that I didn't use on that particular session. Um, and Chris Cohen went up the other end with with probably the um, in-possession group of players and a couple of them, the out-of-possession group of players and worked on a uh, crossing and finishing session. So he, it would basically be um, what we were encouraging the opposition team to do to get the ball out wide. Um, obviously, if they can try and come through us, we, they can come through us. But a lot of the time, we'd, we'd, the way we play and we show outside, the ball would be coming in from wide areas. So Chris took that session up there and basically worked with those players so that when we, when we eventually brought it back to um, bigger numbers, that they were aware and, and engaged in what the session was. Um, and then Chris also worked with um, a, another intern up there in terms of just keeping the session rolling, keeping things moving. If I wanted to take players off Chris, Chris already knew that, that I would give him a shout and he would send players down. Again, we're quite flexible in the way we work. If if I want to send players back to Chris, I send players back. Um, and again, because of where we were on match day plus one, during the session, I changed a number of players around to give them the chance to defend. So we have, we've got a left back who also plays as a, a left-sided winger, attacking winger. So I wanted to give them the, the chance to experience both ways. So we swapped players around um, quite a lot during that session, certainly, and, and that was done during the break time so that we could then get everything set back right and ready to go for the next little bit of the session. I suppose that would really help with the engaging the players, wouldn't it, where they feel like they're getting some real benefit out of certainly... Um experiencing different positions and different opportunities of being maybe the focus team, but also the kind of attention they're getting by all the staff, whether it's head coach, uh, assistant coach or S&C, physio, goalkeeper coach, etc. I think every, every one of the players would have been engaged, including the senior players in that as well. You know, there wasn't um, there wasn't a time where there was any players left to, to one side. They, they were utilised and they were utilised in, in an area of the pitch that they would operate on in, in, in a game at the level that they would play, so the 23s. So there was no, you know, there was there was no one missing out, I don't think, on on a, a, a learning cycle really on that day. And I think that's the, the the idea of the actual model we've got in front. So so you're really clear about what you want to try and achieve and how you're going to try and think about putting experience on for the players. But at the centre, it's the kind of coach decision making model where you're recognizing who you're working with, what you're working them on, and how you're going to try and um Try and put that into place. So you talked around the the mass uh, 
variety and difference in the players you've got at your disposal, whether it's first team, whether it's 23s, whether it's younger players. And as a head coach, you've got to have all these kind of thoughts in your head around how to give everyone the best opportunity in that day possible to try and be the best they can be. Yeah. And, and, and that's that's really important, Stu, because, you know, I, I'm a massive believer and I believe all coaches should be that sometimes, it, well, not sometimes, all the time, players should come off having learned something. They, the, the, the day should be a learning day. Every day should be a learning day. Um, and just alluding to, to what I've just said there about, you know, um, the different types of things we did uh, and the way we did it, that, that doesn't just happen. That's not just random. It's not we're just throwing, oh, you take those five and I'll take these four, or you take those six, I'll take these three. You know, this this is something that's planned and it goes into the planning and preparation. So, you know, the amount of time that, that we spend on the grass is absolute gold dust, but there's also an awful um, lot of time that you spend inside, dare I say, in the classroom or or just outside talking that we, we do the planning. And, you know, obviously... The planning is vitally important to make the session work. And I also think that the players appreciate that. You know, when the players are valued in the planning, I think that's really, really important. And I think we, we you know, we talk around the learning cycle a lot around obviously AYA and also the for A license. But you, you've talked in the past around uh, the contact time with the players is, is, is gold, just like you rightly say. But as they arrive into the academy, you've got the information around what they're doing on the TV screens as well, so they can try and connect straight away to what, what they're looking at? Yeah, so what we we do, or what we did do when I was there, we had a uh, a link going, you know, we've got a couple of TVs up in the canteen where we work. The players also um, have a WhatsApp group. So we send out, or we did send out uh, the session prior to them going to St George's Park about what we were going to do and what the intended outcomes were. And also there's a link on the telly showing them the movement patterns of the warm-up and then also the, the sessions that will be put on. Now, I'm always wary that when you're putting something up for players to look at, one, do you know they're looking at it? Two, what, what do they, how are they interpreting it? Sometimes I'm just happy for it to be on there and, and we can engage. And I might go and, as I'm walking out to the, to the pitch, just grab hold of one of the players and, have a chat with him. You know, did you see the TV this morning? Go on, what, what's your role in this today? You know, why do you think we've put you there? What do you think you need to, to do? How, how can you get, what's your strengths and weaknesses in that area? So I think that, you know, from, from my point of view, it's really important to engage the players in this and they are vital to, to what to what we're trying to do because at the end of the day, like I've said, every day should be a learning day and we're, 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 in, we're in the job of trying to develop these players and, and, turn them into uh, professional salaried footballers in a first team uh, environment, whether that be the club that you work at at that current time or another club outside in, in, in the football league industry. No, no, I think you know, it's a great, great kind of insight and to try and get an idea around how much detail goes into the planning to try and benefit the players and try and maximise the contact time in that kind of that kind of one kind of experiencing within that week. So uh, no, that's that that's brilliant, Jimmy. That so um so, yeah. sorry, just before we go on it, and I think yeah. it's really important to to highlight that you know that board behind me here says eleven v eleven, but it might be that you're going to work with with small numbers. So you know what could I teach two players about a low block? Um and that's where it's really important that as the coaches, you know, you 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 understand what you're teaching these players. And I think it's really important that, you know, for me, I, I, I'd be very happy to work with one player talking about a low block because I would use, if I was talking about uh, practice design, I'd work that player in the area of the pitch that needed to be worked. I'd work him in the area that he's he's based around. So if it's a centre half and it's one centre half, what am I going to do with him? I'm going to talk about him sliding the screen in, into zones two, three and four. Um, I'm going to talk him about moving backwards, moving forwards. I'm going to talk about him needing to, you know, what's the right time to engage, when does he engage, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really, really important that, you know, the coaches that are, that are tuning in and listening realise that it doesn't always have to be big numbers. What does your practice design look like? What are your intended outcomes? And can you achieve those intended outcomes? With one player, yes. With 11 players, yes. With 22 players, yes. With 15 players, yes.
these were when these slides you use obviously at Nottingham Forest. These are being kind of adapted for use on, on, on course, haven't they? So, but very similar detail to it, obviously what you wanted to try and bring to life of your players. So, again, like you've identified, starting with the 11 v 11 shape and how that kind of uh, allows you to make informed decisions around the practices you want to bring to life. And I know as we start moving through the slide that now it will demonstrate how you kind of worked with them um, with small numbers and how, how you started to build the, the numbers and complexity of the of the session as you went through. But again, just from the session deeds on the on the initial first page, you know, you're really clear about what you're going to have after and understand it about the problems which you want the place to kind of think about. And then it's up to you whether you decide whether it's, it's the coach who's going to provide the solutions or it's the questioning from the coach, the shape is coach behaviors around getting the players um, immersed in thinking and how do they kind of bring or think about the principles of play and also the team principles, what they may have to identify their styles to try and come up with the right solutions in, in that time. So this is kind of the overview from the 11 v 11 as it is. But then we've got kind of a smaller breakdown and, and we'll go into a bigger slide so it's not too um, harsh on the eyes as we go through. But it just gives a, a kind of demonstration, Jimmy, around what your thought process were around how to build from the left-hand side to the right-hand side on, on building your numbers for one, but then reducing Chris's numbers as your kind of numbers get bigger. So I'm, yeah. I'm thinking that if we obviously maybe start to think about talking around on the tactic board around your, your kind of first session, really, Jimmy, if that's okay, about yeah. you yeah. work with small numbers and the amount of detail you could get out in that kind of um, in that kind of one session. And what I'm really kind of interested in maybe bringing to life, if that's okay, is around some of the terminology you kind of used. So yeah. Talk around um, blocking hall, defending ugly, sensing danger. And kind of sliding screening. So I don't know if you you might kind of illustrate and demonstrate on the tactic board what that kind of looks like and and why the them words were were used and and how the players kind of uh, understood them kind of words. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, Stu, you know I'm going to take these away now. Um, just drop them down. Um, and this is this is really what it looks like. Hopefully, a little bit in the graph and, and some of the, some of the things we do right here now. Um, might not correspond directly with with the um, slide you're showing, but this is some of the stuff, and this is the flexibility in being adaptive on the day with your numbers. So it's really important for me that I that we we did this. So the way I started was that we had um, we had the pitch set up, and we had two small goals, and you can see I've marked them on here. Why the two small goals? Um, I want we are a team that show outside. So the two small goals would be easier to score in if players come through the middle. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to show the opposition to make sure that they play outside the pitch as much as possible. What we don't want them doing is coming through zone three, um, zone four or zone two. If we can, we want to play them out into zone five and zone one as much as possible. So my setup was this, two small goals. Um, a back four, two holding midfield players. And sometimes I'll take one out and put, put one back in. And that was why I was talking about the flexibility and adaptability of, of what I did on the day. The ball would start, play to 10, play back, and then we're live. Okay. So what we're talking about here, and the first part of my type terminology is slide and screen. So ball gets played out to 11. Okay. As that ball gets played out to 11, Think about what I said earlier on about triggers and cues from the opposition. So if this eight is set to go with his right foot and his shoulders are looking, they're, they're set outside and looking at the 11 body, that ball is going out there. So I want my number eight to have his eyes on the ball, eyes on his man, and already be start to travel as that ball travels out to 11. Now, what I don't want to happen is I now don't want my eight to go like a headless chicken and just overcommit himself and let the 11 come back inside. So what we're trying to say to the eight is stay there, keep, keep him outside of you now. As he does that, it literally is the slide. So we've got the slide there. Now the screen is the, the, the four defenders behind and thinking about where the target is. The target is the goal, the small goal. So we're now sending him away from the small goal as far as possible. Now, what I want the eight to do is to keep him there. Now, 
As 10 comes in and goes past him, four might well drop. But equally, if four goes in, five can still pick up, six can pick up, three is tight and compact, and two is tight and compact. So basically, we have got, we've got a slide and we've got a screen in front of us. Now, what's really important for me is my left back is in zone four, but needs to understand that there is an opposition player in zone five. And whilst that opposition player is in zone five, I want to know that my fullback knows he's there. How will he know he's there? Scanning, using his, his head, his eyes, but also his shoulders. I call shoulders open. So if your shoulders are open, you can see your periphery is much better. You have a 180. If you close, you get 90 degrees. So going from closed at 90, open at 180, all of a sudden I can see an awful lot more. It's really important. So the distances of your men are really important. So we talk about maybe being, if the, if the 18 yard box is 44 yards wide, we don't want to be, we never want to be outside of that. So we're in about 35 yards of space across, across the 18 yard box. Now, if that man goes down there, what I would expect is for him to follow and just look to block off. Now, he comes back out, for instance, say he has come back out. What we do there is we now delay. We don't want to go herring out. But what we do do, we delay and we start to edge. And as we edge, we come up the pitch and we're just holding and we're staying, making sure we're staying compact. So they then have to go around us. Ball is switched this side to seven. Out comes three, across goes four. Why does three come out first on this particular occasion? Because four can't get there. It's too far for four to go. So three starts to come out, shows down the line. I will now want four to slide in and, and also eight to drop back in. And all of a sudden now you've got your slide and you've got your screen in front of you, keeping the opposition on the outside of you as much as possible. Now let's look at a different scenario. If we have 9, 10, 11, 7. 8 gets the ball, plays into 10, we're split. All of a sudden, we've been broken. Now, what do I want my two midfield players to look at doing? Firstly, I don't want my back four to move. I want them to stay there and hold because it's really important. Okay? Now, I look at the recovery runs on my players dropping back. So can you get back? Can you get behind the ball? And can you come in and narrow off and be compact to make a slide and a screen to stop them going through you? If this has already happened and the ball's been played there, what they might look at doing is what we call back tackling and back tracking. So can you get in front of the ball and back tackle? And can the other opposition get behind? For me, all the time, it's really important that the back four are quite solid and they stay where they need to. Now, my other question is, what happens if the nine gets the ball and he's in a, um, an area of space that he, can, that he can receive the ball? What we mustn't allow him to do is turn up. So I'm going to ask that my left-sided centre-half engages. As my left-sided centre-half engages, my full-back and my centre half start to look to get compact and show some control and restraint by just being patient. The six, I don't want to oversell himself. So basically, what I always say to my players, a success is making the player go back to his own goal. So if the nine ends up going back to his own goal, however he plays it, whether he plays it out that way, that way, or backwards, I'm happy with that. Now, let's look at another scenario. Ball gets played into a wide area and they've broken us down. So now we're talking about, I'm going to put the goalkeeper in now and we're going to take away these small goals. So we're now talking about looking at a blocking hole. Now, the blocking hole generally is the first hole nearest the near post. Okay, this area here between the near post and the six-yard box. 
Why do we talk about a blocking hole? Because if this player beats my man, my man will still put pressure on. There is every chance that that ball is coming low and hard across the near post. So I want one, one of my defenders to be in the blocking hole so that he can clear that ball away and get any kind of clearance, ugly defending, sensing danger, all those type of things that I've talked about there. So the defending ugly, the sensing danger, and the blocking hole all start to come into play here now. Now, what is really important for me now at this point is that the five picks up a man and my two picks up a man and my four will drop back in and defend as well. What I can't afford to do and what I don't like seeing from my players is I don't like seeing players who are dropped off and not picked up in the box. I think it's really important that we now, we've got a blocking hole cover, we go man for man, because as I've always explained, and my players used to get tired of me saying it, I never see the name space on the score sheet. Space doesn't score the goal. It's the man that scores the goal. So it's really important that you cover off those zones as you uh, as you go to defend. So you're in, if you look now, I've got three defenders in zone three. Uh, uh, lane three of the pitch, sorry. So that for me is vitally important. And obviously you would have other players tracking back as we go. So when this player now gets that crossing and he clears, it's vitally important that we now get ourselves organised out again and we're back ready to defend when that ball comes back into us. Stu? Jimmy, absolutely fantastic detail and, and really appreciate you obviously going through the terminology, what you, you're using around the blocking hole, defending ugly, sensing danger, sliding, screening. And it just goes to show that the amount of detail you can get within small number of practices to give them something really kind of beneficial. A couple of thoughts, what came off the back of that really, Jimmy, off, off for what you were kind of explaining would be, um, and I've obviously seen this session, would be how does your team then look to um, be on the front foot to try and win the ball back, but then how do they go and then progress up the pitch to go and score? This would in turn um, certainly get some of your players out of position. So then you might start getting a little bit of transition. Um and then you start uh, kind of regrouping and kind of reorganising where players have to fill into different positions, which might be not familiar to themselves. So how, how would that kind of look within that practice um, within a back four and a two? Because I, I'm sure you've done many sessions before yourself where you could play a six v uh, sorry six v eleven, and you probably won't concede a goal all the way through because you're in that kind of defensive mindset that you're not going to let the opposition break you down or score. It's when you start to kind of make it more game like where the real problems occur where you start to take them risk to try and uh, use it as a strategy to try and um, go and attract the opposition up the pitch to try and exploit them further down. So how would that kind of practice look like in a game? So so it's interesting because what we did with this session, once we started to do more on the low block session, we started to talk about embracing the chaos. And what I mean by embracing the chaos is that when I when I talk about defending ugly, I need it to be really clear that I don't mean that you just hack the ball away or smash the ball away because we are a team that will play and can play or we were a team that could play without a doubt. So, but when, when I talk about embracing the chaos, so the ball comes across, for instance, the six does get hold of it. Now we've, we've done plenty of sessions now where I'm not allowing the six to just clip a ball out into the channel, to seven, for instance. They now, the back four and the two midfielders have now got to look to combine to play out. So we're now giving them uh, challenges to say, okay, under pressure, can you play out in a calm way and look to break the press? The second thing would be exactly what you just said, Stu, is that I would look, that would, how, uh, that would probably be how it would look the deeper it got for me in terms of a low block. I've watched low blocks in in the um, in terms of um, pre uh, Premier League football, and low block sometimes has everyone back behind the ball looking like that. I like to leave one up because I believe if you do clear and there's nothing there, it's always going to come back at you very very quickly anyway. Now my number nine, I would ask him always to try and what I call mirror the ball. So if the ball is on this side of the pitch, I want my nine on this side of the pitch. Why? 
because if the clearance is going to come this way, basically he's in an area to challenge for the ball. If the ball goes across the box and it's over there and they're challenging, does the not that I want the nine to make a different type of movement? And we're not asking him to sprint. It's just a, a jog or a saunter across. It comes out the other side. He's in a position. But when we look to play out, I want to play through and we look to break that press. Now, as we break that press, that's when my 11 and my seven will go and they'll look to get forward very quickly. It was really important that we, when we, when we did break off of a low block and we came out of it, that we actually got at least three or four people forward as quick as possible. So it would be the seven, the nine, the 11 and the 10 that would break forward as much as possible. And we would ask them to go after the ball. And that's where our high press would come into it. They would be the ones. At that point, we would expect these six players and the GK to actually take up a position that would help us support the players looking to get on the ball as quick as possible. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't just saunter out. We would actually get up the pitch as quick as possible. Our, our, our recovery runs, we always talked to them, were sprints. Our forward support runs were always sprints. But there was always an area of one of the principles of play of constraint um, in there because we needed to be a little bit patient. So I would then say to the players, listen, you see it. You're out there. You can feel it. If you can't for some reason, get out as quick as possible. Don't just one of you go. You need to all be talking to each other and you need some, some, some communication uh, with each other. So it's really important that you've got that. And we, as I say, we look to get forward as quick as possible. If we can't do that, we will certainly look to play and try and break um, th their press as much as possible as well. And you know what? At times, I would have to accept that my players were trying to do what we were asking and, and, and trying to develop them, and they would make the, the odd mistake. But at the same time, I'll go back to where I started, is that I'm trying to develop players. So... If defending ugly does mean you need to put your foot through the ball, then you need to put your foot through the ball. If defending ugly means that you're going to have to slide tackle, as long as you win that ball, then you slide tackle. If, if defending ugly means you're going to have to put your head in where it might get kicked, you might have to do that. But the best defenders, you know, the John Terrys, the Puels, the Tony Adams, they, they all had that in their locker in abundance. And I think they relish that. And certainly some of the younger players that I work with in that group absolutely love attacking the ball and putting their bodies on the line. Yeah, and I suppose it's one of them, isn't it? It's, it's working with what you've got to try and develop them. If you're in performance, it's recognising maybe the players you've got at your disposal and getting the best out of them and playing a style which um, enhances their kind of strength. So if you have got maybe uh, quick wide players, for example, this might be a, a tactic and strategy you can deploy to try and uh, certainly try and stop the, the opposition's attacking threat, but also to try and bring them on you, bring them onto you to try and exploit your strengths as well around the yeah. players you've got available to you. Um, I suppose in your kind of context in Nottingham Forest, as you identified before, there being, you know, you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with teams to try and um, defend higher up the pitch. Suppose that the kind of emphasis around the transitional elements where players are out of position provides you with different problems that, you might not be initially in a low block, but you might be recruiting players to try and get into that block, to try and get that kind of defensively uh, sound shape to then hopefully win the ball back on the front foot to then go and uh, deploy your kind of in-possession plan. Uh, what I think what would be interesting now, Jim, if you wouldn't mind, is if you maybe set your block up and then maybe if we try and throw different ways to try and, to try and challenge him, break it down and think about what the information may be uh, around that. So I'm just thinking, obviously, the deeper you are with your kind of retreat line and depending where you set your engagement line to, um, it's going to be probably difficult trying to play the ball over you. Yeah. So initially, I'm thinking either it, we've got to either go round because that's the space you're allowing us or we've got to try and play through depending on what the capabilities of the blue team may be. Now, yeah. um, straight away, I'm thinking the the kind of importance is zone 14. So how do I maybe get players um, within the gaps within the spaces, within the pockets of space to try and um, certainly for one, narrow your back line off. Yeah. To either uh, get them out of shape and create a bit of chaos, but then also maybe if I needed to, 
trying to attack in the wide areas. Um, so I'm thinking that maybe um, could we bring maybe uh, four backs in as well, Jimmy? So yeah, so if it does, if we have got ultimate width, so seven eleven really wide, and then we're playing maybe an eight and ten in the half space, pushing across the four. So if the four is in possession of the ball, maybe in a deeper area. How might you cope with certain situations where if I'm travelling up the pitch towards your block, and my yeah. eight and ten are on the outside of your kind of two holding midfield players? How are you trying? How you try and get them to midfielders to try and protect the nine? Yeah. So, so looking at this now, if if this was a situation that happened, um, obviously I'm going to revert back very quick to what I just said. I would expect these the seven and the eleven um, to be looking like they're Olympic sprinters. Yes, on their way back. But the scenario is what you just set me here. I would, I wouldn't want my players to to budge much here. Okay. I would want them to to show constraint and just be patient because if we fly out at you, Stu, you're going to be able to pick us off. Right now, I still would fancy my group to defend this ball from going in your in the goal. So what I what I would still be saying is, if anything, is I'd ask these two to narrow off even more. Looking at it, and I, I might have to, I, I may well have to, having to be shouting that instruction to them from from the side if this was a question, because I would still want the ball being going outside. I definitely don't want the ball coming through to the nine to get that situation there. Yes. Now, what what if that does happen? Like I said earlier on, it would be the six, and we've shown that scenario where the six engages. But there comes a time where if your nine drops off so far. He then becomes a, 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 a problem for my two midfield players uh, because I don't want my six coming out of the pocket too far. Uh, I want that. I want that bank of four to stay there because let me revert back to my sort of menu. I need I need a screen, and my screen is my back four in front of my goalkeeper. And um, I, I would basically say to you at this moment in time, you two narrow yourself off so that you're in. You're both inside of lane three. We want to be showing the ball outside to lanes two and four. And at some point, once we've got the, if we can get the delay on, then we can get the seven and 11 back in behind the ball. Then we can hopefully show them out into lanes five and lanes one. That may well not happen. It might be that you receive the ball down in lane five and now you're in a crossing situation. Yeah. And what would be the implications as well if the four did have the ball and he started to drive towards the two midfield players, but the eight okay. and 10 started to play off the shoulder and in, in behind the pocket. So like that. Yeah, try and play in between the spaces. Yeah. So again, I'm just talking delay as much as you can because at the moment we've got one player occupying four. So I'm still saying we're comfortable in terms of, yeah, we may be overloaded, underloaded, sorry, in terms of our team as a whole. But right now in, in the centre of the pitch where you are going to want to penetrate and you're going to want to come through generally to score a goal, I would say that we've got a decent screen up in front of the goalkeeper to stop that happening. So I would just, I would still call for constraint and I would look for us to delay as, as much as possible so that we, and I remain delayed to the last second, nth of a second, because as soon as any team that's trying to break a low block will want someone to break ranks, be ill disciplined, come off the shape. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the best teams in the world will see that come off their shape and bang, they play the pass and they're through and they've broken the low block. And for me, that's exactly what you do not want happening when you are trying to operate this. So if he's driving through at me, I'm saying retreat, retreat and just stay and be patient as much as you can. Because what's <coughs> what's going to happen is they're eventually going to fall onto my, my defenders anyway. So it becomes a matchup. It's a 1v1. It's a 2v2. So I, I ju I'm just going to say to him, please, please don't go and rush to the ball. When I watch senior pre premiership championship football, I'm amazed at how many players sell themselves by, by going to the ball and they sell themselves and they do unnecessary running. And for me, I think if we can teach younger players how to be efficient in terms of defending, they will be uh, much more effective at it as and, and in, in them individuals being effective at it 
the team will become more, much more efficient at defending and not conceding goals. I think that's a, gr a great point. And I think the, the information you've kind of given around ball being central is key. And you've delayed us well enough where you managed to regroup and you managed to get back into shape. And it may have been now my eight and ten are dropping a bit deeper because they can't affect that space in between the blocks. So I don't know if you're recovering wide players want to get back into two banks of four and how you might deploy one of your forward players to try and provide. So the ten would still keep them, as I said earlier. Yeah. They'll keep the nine. I, I, I don't want the nine coming back. Yeah. You know, th this, this would be, I think, and should be, if we were in the classroom now, should be a real, a real area now for a conversation. Because someone should argue it with me as to why. Yeah, so uh, why would you say that, Jimmy? Why would you not want the nine coming back? Because I, I always want us to have an out. If if I if I push him back there, that just allows them to get higher up the pitch and keep keep what I call it runs of attack. I want to stop their runs of attack as much as possible. So by having this threat at any given time, and and this person who played for me was very, very quick as was the seven and as was the 11. The two boys in here were absolute genius on the ball, real good architects of, of setting play up and, and providing, but both could drive with the ball very quickly, but both could pass the ball over 50 yards with very little backlift. So we had a, we had a number of situations there where I'm saying keep that player and make that player mirror the ball, as I've said. But also, if he just engages two players for me, that's good enough. And, and, a, and a clever centre forward will engage two defenders of the opposition quite easily. And I suppose that um, really comes on to my next point, Ivan. If I kind of pose you a different problem by dropping my eight and ten towards the in between the lines of the eight and four and the seven and eleven, and my wide players now, instead of staying ultimate with go inside to be inverted wide players, which allows my fullbacks to go high and wide. Yeah. Because that's what you're trying to allude to around the opportunity, what might be afforded to you around trying to exploit the space I've allowed you. Yeah. So at this point now, if, you, if you're doing that, I think my seven has to drop back in and track. There, therefore, the four will go back, the eight drops back in, and then my opposite 11 needs to be into lane two. So now all of a sudden, Stu, You've got your two banks of four. Now, if that's happened and you've got an overlap there, um, and I did do this session at St. George's Park, and I've got it written down here, a 4v4 box game um, where you've just got four attackers v four defenders in the 18-yard box, and you've got a player crossing from a wide position, and literally you've just got to go man for man and defend the ball. <clears throat> and for me, th that's, that's where, you know, the best defenders in the world earn their top dollar because when they come in, not only can they, I go back to my menu, not only do we, they get someone in the blocking hole, they sense danger. They will um, defend ugly. They'll do whatever they need to do to keep the ball out the net. Uh, and one of the things um, that you and I spoke about prior to this was uh, <coughs> there will be a time when a good team will break the block and that's when you're going to need your very good goalkeeper to pull off the amazing save or stop and snuff out anything that might be coming his way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's the, the, the what ifs, isn't it? So in an ideal world, the shape's the shape and you, you, you win the ball back and you attack. But we've not really mentioned about um, players running in, in advance of your line to try and kind of cause disruption. And we've not really touched upon yet around balls being inside your box. So if the ball is with a fullback now and putting balls into your box, what's the considerations around what kind of starting positions do you want from your goalkeeper? What positions do you want your kind of defensive players to take up? And how does that kind of first contact look like? And and where ideally would you want the ball to be kind of um, kind of cleared to? Yeah. So again, if I go back to this shoe, let me just put some players in there. So we're tracking back. We're getting some of your players in there. So Six would be the blocker here in this position. He's just got on the outside of my fullback. <coughs> I'd want my five to defend. I'd want my two to defend. Now, what I would say, and I think this is a really important point, if this happens <coughs> and this scenario happened and you didn't get players back quick enough, obviously you'd want your goalkeeper in terms of 
across the, across the half of the goal, understanding where that cross, because you don't want the cross going straight inside the near post. So his position is important not to be beaten at the near post, but also be aware of what's coming on the outside shoulder and can he give information. If this was to happen, we had an underload basically of a 3v2 three, three on the back post area. I am, I am ha absolutely happy for my players at that moment in time to leave him and leave him free at the back post. And I'm saying that because I want them to go and mark the nearest players to the ball, which would, in this, this case would be the 10 and the 9. Now, if all of a sudden the two, the two of your player is clever and clips that ball up, what I'm asking my two to do is get across, get across, and the six will now come across and mark as well. So all of a sudden you've now got a 3v3. But what the two can't do in this situation is go herring in like I've already spoken about to the 11, where the 11 just bypasses him and then puts the ball in the back of the net. The two has to show constraint and patience and in, in a way not panic because because the opposition are inside our 18-yard uh, box. Just stay on his feet, get his body shape right, eyes on the ball, look at the, the foot patterns of the, the player in possession and just concentrate on his 1v1 duel against his opponent. Make sure he doesn't allow him to drop his shoulder and come inside to face the centre of goal. I suppose the you know if I was looking at the attacking team, I'd be making sure if I could make first contact, I'd be trying to make sure that you can't get a comfortable clearance and trying to make it so you can maybe knock the ball down for one of my attacking players to pick the ball up in the box. So how would you then coach around um, you know, the real emergency defending where you've got to really put your body on the line? What would you kind of how would you encourage the players to to really be kind of experts at doing that because it's it's a real art yeah so can i just show you a session that we did then that we did we went on and done and so it's just basically very simple um so we had one two three four and this is the session we done Stu. um and we had an eight here so four where's my two We had that, that's that's what we did. So we basically had a situation here of just defending the goal. So the eight would get the ball. He'd play to seven. Seven could play back to two. Two would put it in the box. Played to seven. Touch out of his feet. Put it in the box. And then it was about um, the defending team scored points by clearing the eighteen yard box, just clearing it out. <coughs> what the the, the Blues had to do. They had the chance of, of, of trying to score, obviously. So what I would do, I would have had a number of balls just here as well. So that first ball goes and gets played, gets put in the box. It gets cleared on this one. There's another ball. Now we're playing in front and you've got to defend. My, my team need to defend the ball. And it's about <coughs> can you get yourself in front of the ball? Can you make yourself big, wide, thick, and strong and be it on the on, on the front foot to start. And can you make sure that you keep and deflect and, and delay and get that ball away from your goal as much as possible? And you talked about I mean, your number nine being quick in your wide players. You know, what kind of areas would would if the ball came off the right hand side out of lane five into your box, where would where would you ideally want the ball to be kind of cleared to? And how would that so then affect if your team, how they move up the pitch? Yeah, if we were talking of low blocks, Stu. I'd have to say that any deflection is a good deflection at this moment in time. In an ideal world, you want to go, you know, the old-fashioned saying of going high and wide. Um, but you basically, I would prefer the ball, if it, even if the ball ended up staying in the 18-yard box, I would prefer the ball to go high for us to readjust our position than to go low and be bobbling about in the box where they could get a snapshot off and we can't get a block on it. So I'm asking my players to put their body on the line, stop that ball going in the box by getting a um, what I'd call a the biggest surface they can on the ball to actually get the ball and clear the ball as much as possible. So the height would gain your team time? A absolutely. So you imagine me throwing a ball way above your head 
Um, you see it in the games now when when free kicks are given to the to the team. The team that's given the free kick away, they'll pick the ball up, but they'll throw it up. They won't throw it away. They'll throw it up. So it gives them a second or two just to get a little bit more time because we don't see so many free kicks being taken quickly now, but they just throw the ball above their head where they can't catch it. It's too high. And that's what I'm saying about clearing as well. If we can be in a position to get, you know, if I head the ball away and it goes 18, well, 10 feet in the air, it's going to have to drop, well, let's say 12 feet in the air. It's going to have to drop to about eight feet or eight and a half feet before I can catch it and put it down and play. Equally, if it's in, in play, in live play, it's going to have to drop to me in six foot one before I can head a ball at least. And then you're talking about it dropping down lower than that to go to the lower part of your body before you get the shot off. So the higher the, the clearance can be, if you can get distance on it, absolutely fantastic. Distance would be brilliant. But if you can't, let's get height on it first. Brilliant points. And I think the, um, you know, even looking at the opposition again, I think the, the teams who are most successful at trying to beat the low block uh, ring it really well. And they try and work off the, um, the, you know, the way of trying to get second, third and fourth phase attacks. So I suppose when you're thinking and considering around clearing, you're trying to, Maybe if you can, if it's um, if it's able to, to try and beat that block. But if it doesn't beat the block and it's going to go into the possession of the opposing team, how far would you want your back line to come out? And when do they start to slow down? And what's the kind of body shape in preparation for the next ball coming in? Yeah, so again, if, if it was cleared away, for instance, here, and it comes out to the ring there, I'm just, I'm, you know, I know numbers are different, but if we're looking at that type of ring um, like that, then I'm saying to them, we need to get up to 18-yard box as quick as possible, but we need to be in lanes four, three, and two only. And depending on which side of the pitch the ball is, Stu, you would predominantly be more over to that, that lane. So if I look at this ball being in lane four now, I'm saying we, we basically, we need two in lane three quite tight together. You possibly could put all three, all four players in lane four and three, but with the, the fullback, um, the right side of fullback here, right on the on the line between two and three. But for me, I would be very nervous that one ball over the top would do the fullback. So I might look at the fullback saying, just edge yourself a little bit. And in terms of your distance, make sure you've got your shoulders open and you can see that that, that man is going to come in with you. Because if he makes what we call the blindside run, which players do now, and you get great players who can clip that ball, it's really important. Equally, I want my goalkeeper to come and clip that as well. If he can see it, can he see that danger and come out and collect it? So, you know, he would be vital to us here in terms of shuffling that back four up, getting them up the pitch, and also making sure that he could come and collect as well. Brilliant. No, fantastic. I think the, um, the, the amount of detail and the... I suppose it's just kind of completing the loop now, really thinking about um, the the reflection process. Yeah. Um, around, you know, the 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 uh, the amount of detail and the amount of uh, specific detail you've gone into, linking with the intended outcomes, what you plan for the outset. You know, for, certainly from, from my point of view, you've touched upon and, and explained them in, in massive detail uh, and a lot more as well. So what was your kind of key reflections, um, probably two really, around the work you did with Nottingham Forest around this um, topic at SGP, but also around how we've kind of delivered this on the UEFA A as well? So I want, whenever I do a session with any players, whether it be uh, at a club where I've worked before or you're doing something on an A licence with a group of students who are coming to, to help you out or even the candidates themselves, I feel that that session at SGP with the, the Forest players was successful. Why? We didn't concede. <clears throat> and the session was filmed for an hour and two minutes and we didn't concede a goal. Therefore, for me, that's that's a success. And that's how you should judge your success sometimes. But equally, the, the success is around the learning of the players as well. So um, Prior to you and I meeting up, we talked about some of the players, and which I'm not going to name on here, but there was two players in, in particularly there who we were we were looking at in terms of sending out on loan, but who had not had loads of match minutes. So that was really um, important for us to, 
sort of get a little idea of and they'd and they'd both been injured as well. So it was it was getting an idea of where where they are in terms of their rehabilitation. Are they ready to go out? Do they look rusty? You know, what what do they what did they add to the session? What did they get out of the session? Is it that we need to give them another another couple of weeks on the grass with with our lads in terms of getting their their hips open better, their foot patterns right, they're, they're seeing triggers quicker, um, the communication needs to be better, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, those kind of things that were taken in consideration. And um, even if I'm doing that on a, a an A license, I would be I'd be looking to see as learning taken place. And if learning has taken place, even if it's a, a, a tiny bit of learning, because not everyone learns in a, a, a different at the same time, they're all at different stages and different different ways of learning as well. So, you know, what what happened with the players and 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 how did they find it? So when we on on the van on the way back to to the club, we had a chat about it, and and they they all enjoyed being at St George's and in the environment, and they all enjoyed the session in terms of the defenders. Obviously, the strikers weren't so pleased because they didn't score goals, but then that's the time for me where the environment becomes a nice environment for the players where they can have a little bit of banter with each other. No, fantastic. And I think the, um, you know, obviously through all your experiences throughout your week, your month, your seasons kind of work, you'll you'll adjust the practice to try and provide certain challenges to the individuals in, in that unit anyway, wouldn't you? To try and, you know, to, you know, if the attackers are finding it difficult to break them down, then you'd put your team in a, in a kind of unbalanced nature to try and create balance before the before the attackers obviously get a chance to score. So how yeah. you can slightly adjust your session to try and manage difference, to try and create the right challenge point, to try and bring out all these kind of outcomes you want the players to learn. You know, that's that's something you play with over a period of time. And I think that's the key thing around the kind of uh, coach plan and reflective model, that you can be really specific around what you want to try and get the players to think about, but not go after too many things that actually nothing takes place. Yeah. I think if you look at <clears throat> what we've done there, you know, uh, the, the game is 11 v 11. We, we, everyone knows that as well, but I, I've literally worked with um, six, seven players there, which is a goalkeeper back four to, to holding midfield players, but you can make so many little changes to, to the session. You can take, a midfield player out. You can have a defender that's been done on the halfway line and he's down injured and, and all those kind of things. You can make the subtle changes that you want within the session that will then challenge the players. Because then when you're when you make the subtle changes, you are challenging the players to deal with it and it becomes live. So you know again with 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 the small numbers you get loads and loads of chance to do repetition. But is the repetition relevant to what and, and where they need it? Hopefully it will be. Um, and sometimes you you might take away. So the, the the session I did with the ball going on the outside and the lad crosses it. Well, people would challenge me, and I'd expect them to challenge me and say, "Well, would that happen in a game?" I would say, "No, it wouldn't." But for the session of the defending four feet four v four in the box, I want the ball to come in the box. Therefore, I'm just setting it up to a position where a cross has happened. How it's happened, we don't know. But a cross is coming in. There's a 4v4 situation in the box. Therefore, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I need to do. I, I, have, I, I don't apologise for it. I don't need to apologise for it. What, what's the other alternative? I have a coach throwing a ball in from the sideline. I might as well work with a lad who's a winger crossing a ball in. So he's working on his, on his game anyway, as opposed to a coach throwing a ball in or half following the ball in for players to clear. And, and just kind of bring this to some kind of conclusion, and it's it's certainly um, certainly not a criticism. It's you know the simplicity around how you design your practice to meet the intended outcomes is actually genius. And I think that when you think about your intended outcomes over a period of time, you know you've you've obviously gone tech tack with with you know most of them. Communication obviously might be in the uh, the social corner, uh, but you know you can certainly integrate the four corners within within whatever you're trying to go after to try and meet the needs of the players. So. Absolutely fantastic detail um, and just bringing it kind of to a close really around some of the things we've kind of talked around. So, you know, you've talked a lot around uh, your considerations on the player profile. So I know that within the, the 23s you're working with, you obviously, um, you sometimes are able to recruit players, but often the players are through and within the kind of club structure already. 
But I suppose it goes to show that, you know, the successful teams in the wider domain, you know, they really kind of focus on playing a style that suits the players they've got at their disposal. And if they have got maybe pacey, quick attacking players and good defenders, then this might be a, a tactic and strategy what they want to try and deploy to try and bring success. Um, and likewise, if that is a way they are thinking of bringing success to their team because they want to perform and win, um, a lot of the practices will inform, uh, you know, how to go and um, train and, and kind of inform their players and how to be successful around it. And I suppose the, the physical development of players will be key in, in relating to the practices. So you talked around um, at the very start of the presentation about the match day plus one. Um, was there a consideration around bringing the pitch in um, width ways, but also length ways to try and um, minimise the loading? And also, I know it will uh, minimise the loading and give you lots of returns that way, but it might um, reduce some of the returns because you might not get as much realism in terms of uh, the space to attack or space to defend, etc. Yeah, we, 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 we did talk about it, Stu. Um, and like I said earlier, that the strength conditioning coaches there with the physio, they've got a, a live feed for me as well. So, you know, and I'm not, no, everyone's, not everyone's got that. So I, I'm very fortunate. But for, for me, obviously, the answer is we could have done that. But I was quite happy with the way the session went in terms of the outcomes we were getting in, uh, from, from the team out in possession. So to be able to get balls coming in from wide areas was important. And we didn't, we didn't, you know, although I've shown on here sometimes the five lanes, we did some of that practice within lanes two, three and four anyway. Um, so there wasn't so much running. But when all of a sudden I want to change the the sort of concept to the practice and in terms of shifting my team in terms of, right, can I really see the slide and screen happening now? Are that, Do they get the slide and screen? I think the wider you can make the pitch, you see the slide and screen better. The tighter the, the pitch, the slide and screen is not so so obvious, but you can see the subtle movements just to stop the ball coming through the middle of you. So, um, the you know, I suppose the trade-offs you get when you are bringing pitches in, narrowing pitches, is that you'll, you'll get more repetition, you'll get probably more contacts on the ball, um, and, and, and you you probably get, you, you might get more outcomes in terms of blocks towards the goal. Um, equally, the, the, on the on the flip side of it is that when you go and play the 11 v 11, the pitch is wider. So I want to make sure that my players understand pitch geography as well. So it's important, I think, that you you link link it all in. And then going back to what you said, the physical implication of that match day plus one, uh, trying to get five or six K out of that, that session would have would have helped us by having the pitch bigger as well. And I suppose by the time you start moving towards the, the game day and you start to think about going medium and larger pitches, that'll start increasing the decision-making, both of your team out of possession and both the team in possession? Absolutely, absolutely yeah. It, 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 and and that, that's absolutely spot on, really, what you've said there. And I suppose the, the, the next kind of questions, it, it, they, obviously they can be aimed at you, but I, thought, I suppose it's the, the, uh, the kind of learners watching this kind of presentation is your, your kind of plan to win. So people people might be positioned in the performance end, but they might be positioned in the development end. So, you know, just to really get them to think about what, what does winning look like for them. So, for example, if I'm working with the under nines, winning is not really that important, but the winning may be that I want to try and get and encourage my players to um, excel at defending 1v1. So the kind of thought-provoking questions I'm trying to going to leave people with, hopefully, are, you know, what's it like with your environment to your players and what has the workshop got you kind of thinking about, but keeping these kind of things in mind really about what are the technical requirements of the players to perform tactically in the game. So what's tactically desirable and what is technically achievable and what physical qualities do you need to support the above? So I think we'll leave it at that. I mean, big thanks uh, to yourself, Jimmy, uh, to Thank share you. your expertise and knowledge around um around the theme and the topic. You really brought the kind of slides to life, so I really appreciate that. And uh, all the very best to the learners watching and uh, look forward to seeing everyone soon.